I think it's safe to say that most people think of first responders as police officers and firefighters as these really tough, unshakable people. Yet we're seeing that those people, those first responders, die by suicide at a rate three times higher uh, than they do in line of duty deaths. That's scary. It's incredibly scary. Why is that happening? It's happening because they have such an instinct to take care of others. And their instinct is also that they never want to appear weak. And there's very much been a stigma in law enforcement for generations that to seek mental health or to admit that you're struggling would be considered a weakness. And so we're just now starting to see a culture shift to allow for psychological injury to be viewed in the same way as physical injury in that you're allowed to admit to it and heal from it without that being a weakness. It, it seems kind of like an obvious answer here, but what's happening on the job that's creating this problem? There's, there's two forms of trauma that responders deal with on a regular basis. They deal with kind of critical incident trauma, um, big cases, things like that, but there's also the vicarious trauma they're exposed to other people's trauma every single day. Every shift, they're dealing with people who are in crisis, and that takes a toll on, on anyone who's, who has an instinct to take care of and protect others to be witnessing trauma all day, every day. But, well, when does the trauma start to take a toll? What, what's the progression? It takes a toll right away. Anytime you're looking at an injury, they're being exposed to potential for psychological injury from day one. So we have to help them learn to recover from injury. What unfortunately sometimes happens is when that injury is ignored, it gets worse. So often law enforcement officers, responders in general can ignore it for a while, but over time it starts to build up. They see this stuff so often, uh, the trauma that is, the day-to-day, -day, in and out of the job. How do they differentiate between uh, feeling sympathetic towards someone who's struggling and recognizing depression in, them, in themselves? Where's that fine line? I think it's an education piece. They have to understand they're just as susceptible to depression symptoms, trauma symptoms, stress symptoms as anybody else. And helping them learn that's not a weakness, that's simply a part of the job. None of them would ever believe that they could get through the job without experiencing a physical injury. That's something they all know from time to time they're going to have a physical injury. What we have to help them understand is you're also going to be psychologically injured. That's part of the job. You can't see trauma all day every day and not have that take a toll. So it's not a question of necessarily preventing the injury. It's about learning to identify it and heal from it and see that as just a natural part of your day-to-day -day, the same way you would a, a workout regime. Hmm. Why now? Why are we just starting to talk about this? I mean, uh, decades of law enforcement and we're just starting to recognize that these officers and, and firefighters need help when they come home? Right. For decades, it was the, the coping strategy was drinking and the coping strategy was ignoring it. And we've heard from family members of, of responders from generations who say they shut down, they stop engaging at home, and they drink. And they don't talk about it. And the family doesn't talk about it. So it's not a question of these injuries didn't exist before. It's just now we're realizing, you know, we can actually do something to help with that. And you don't have to just disengage from your life and drink and have that be the only way you cope. These are tough people. Yes. Uh, and you hear all the time about leaving it all out on the field, not taking your work home with you. Mm -hmm. That's so much easier said than done, especially mm -hmm. when you're a first responder. Absolutely. I mean, how can they work with their families or their families work with them to make sure that they can separate the two? We have to educate family members on ahead of time realizing what does your responder need when they come home? When they've had a rough day, are they the type who do need to verbally process? Do they need time to play with their kids? Do they need just some downtime to relax and, and kind of process more in their own head? But that's a proactive conversation that families need to have. A lot of times responders assume that their family members can't handle the details of the traumas that they see. A lot of spouses and partners can handle more than their responder believes they can. So there has to be a conversation had about how are we actually going to manage um, these stressors as a family. So family needs to, to work on this issue. The first responder themselves need to work on this issue. 
but so do departments, mm -hmm. fire departments and police departments. And, and the Ruderman Family Foundation did a really in-depth study. It's the one that's cited all the time when we talk about this issue. So I just want to read this statistic real quick. Of the 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country, fewer than 5% of departments had suicide prevention programs mm -hmm. at the time of this study. 5%. That's a problem. It's a huge problem. The problem is also that agencies tend to be underfunded. A lot of agencies were kind of spoiled in the metro area to believe that most agencies are well-funded, large agencies with a lot of resources. A lot of agencies across the country are tiny agencies, 10, 15, even fewer um, responders, and, and so they don't have the resources. And unfortunately, because mental health has never really been until now seen as um, a key issue, funding goes to other key issues. And so now agencies are starting to see this has to be addressed and they have to offer these programs. You're helping address this in Colorado. Are, are you seeing this problem slowly start to be fixed? Yes. How so? I see a lot of the agencies here in Colorado taking a much more proactive approach to the services they offer. They're training up specialized units within their agencies called peer support teams. And these peer support teams are responders who are specially trained to support their fellow officers um, and responders. They get 40 hours, uh, sometimes more, training in mental health that's specifically focused on how do I help an officer who might be struggling? Um, how do I make sure that they get the resources they need? How do I make sure they know it's not a weakness and there's nothing wrong with them if they seek those support services? So peer support is huge. Um, specialized police and public safety psychology is a young field, but it's becoming much more common. And so they have many more options now of where to seek that extra level of support when they need it. Chaplain services, um, there's a lot of services that Colorado, I think, is really good at. You were mentioning young. Yes. Um, and we were talking earlier about how this affects people of different ages. Mm -hmm. for, for me, people of, of my age in their 20s and their 30s, even in their 40s, are a little bit more comfortable speaking about some of their uh, depression or anxiety issues than, than older folks. Do you see that amongst police departments? Absolutely. Um, we, we call them the crusty older guys. <laughs> um, officers of an uh, older generation have not been trained on talking about mental health. They are trained, suck it up buttercup, go to work, rub some dirt in it, and move on to the next call. That's what they were trained on. And so coming up through the academy in their early years in the job, that was all they knew. And so it's very hard for them to change that and now start opening up about mental health issues. We're starting to see it even in the older generations, they're a little bit more willing, but we're really seeing it um, really take hold of the younger generations. They're much more receptive. You're the wife of a first responder. Uh, you're around this community often. How do you interact with your, your family and your loved ones um, given your position? I mean, what, what is the model for solving this problem? I think even within my relationship, we're very open that we, we talk about what can we each handle. We're very good at balancing each other in terms of stress. Um, we talk about our own experiences. We make sure that our responders, um, my husband and his agency, me with my agencies, we talk really openly. And so we encourage that open dialogue. We don't just tell them, if you need something, talk about it or ask for help. We talk about stuff as well to really show that leadership for them. Um, I, I want you to speak directly to first responders right now. For that man or woman who is struggling uh, w with what they've seen in the field or something else, when they take it home, uh, how should they react? What can they do to help themselves and help their families? The biggest thing I always encourage responders is, please don't judge yourself. This is a psychological injury you will be okay, you're not weak, you're not broken for struggling with, with depression, with trauma, with stress. It's okay to seek services. There's a lot of people who have, and we just simply want people to recognize you will be um, a leader in your agency if you're willing to take care of yourself, really show how that's done, and go back and talk about it. That's a big deal. I feel like a lot of people are, are worried about what help looks like. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like? So that's a great question, and I think help can look a lot of different ways. They can start with talking to their peer support team within their agency, or they can schedule an appointment. 
Um, really what that looks like is you, you call, a, hopefully, a, someone who specializes in the culture who understands this. You make an appointment, and what I, all of my responders do in their very first session is they come in and they're bouncing off the walls. They're talking about a million different things, and then they always apologize for it, saying, I'm so, I'm so all over the place. That's exactly what you're supposed to do, is throw all the gunk on the table, let us organize it, we'll figure it out, and we'll get you in a place where you've organized all of your experiences. You don't have to come in knowing what to talk about. You don't have to come in knowing exactly what the issue is. You can come in and simply say, I feel off. Something's wrong and I don't know what it is. I'm snapping at my family. I don't have energy. I'm disengaged and I don't know why. That's all you have to say. We can figure it out from there. It's really interesting that you say people are kind of all over the place oh, yeah. in the first session. That's going on inside. Yeah. And finally they let it out. Right. That's got to be a huge relief for them. It's a huge relief, but they're so structured that sometimes they won't seek help because they, they can't organize it for themselves and they don't want to appear disorganized. That doesn't fit their, their personality. But it absolutely, there's, there's a lot of science that tells us what works for organizing experiences. The brain is very... Um, structured. It wants to organize every experience we go through into a box. I always describe it as think of your brain as a giant mailroom and there's all these mailboxes. Most of your experiences are pretty routine and so the mail just goes into the box that's already created. But anytime you have an experience that's outside the norm, there's no box for it. Trauma being one of those that is an experience that doesn't have a box. And science tells us that what works to build a mailbox is talking about the experience or writing it down. Those are the two ways that you build a box for that experience so that you can put it away and put it on the shelf. We know that it's tough to build that box, especially within a fire department or a police station with all of these uh, kind of macho people, right. uh, these really tough guys. They're really strict, right? They have, mm -hmm. they have uh, the, the, an idea about how things should be and talking about them isn't one of those things. It isn't, but we're really starting to see some incredible leaders in agencies here in the metro area who are cops, cops, and the tough, macho first responders. And they have really chosen to take the lead in their agencies and have the conversation. Um, we actually created a video where it's, agent, it's different agencies all showing up to the table and they're leading the conversation. They're talking openly about their experiences and these are really well-respected um, responders in their agency having the conversation publicly on film so that they can show the people they care about it's okay to talk about it. It's the big, beginning of big change. It's a huge change. What's the perfect scenario? What's the end game for you? The end game for me is that responders start to see mental health as simply something that they do consistently to take care of themselves every day, every week, throughout their whole career. They involve their families in that. They talk openly about it in their agencies and they don't shame themselves for it. It's simply part of overall health. Um, the last and probably most important question, where can people go for help? Where do you recommend they go? So there's several different uh, agencies here in the metro area that are public safety professionals, counseling firms here in the metro area. There's several of them, so people can find those. Um, Responder Strong is another agency locally that is addressing some of these issues. Code 4 is my firm. They can seek me out. Um, there's, there's chaplain services. There's peer support trainings. Um, really, they can contact any of us, and we can help point them towards, the, towards those resources. Sarah, thanks so much for coming. I Absolutely. appreciate you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm.